Okay. All right. So I'm recording now. So just be aware if you talk, it'll end up being in the recording. Uh, and then if you want to go and look back at anything that I went over, uh, I should be able to have the recording posted by later this afternoon. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to take just a moment to show you how you can get the example code for today's lesson into our studio. So if you go to vanderbilt.lt slash r, that will take you to the lesson landing page. And then under today's lesson, there's a link for lesson r script. So I'm just going to open that up. Oh, great. <laughs> OK, so the control panel covers up the top of my tabs on the browser. That's interesting. OK, so here is the R script. Uh, and in order to, uh, th the easiest way to get it into our studio is to simply click on the raw button. And that gives you the whole thing as text. Then you can just do Control A or Command A uh, to highlight the whole thing. Then do Control C or Command C to copy the whole thing. Then if you go over to our studio, um, uh, now the chat box is covering things up. OK. Uh, and say, uh, you, you can click on this uh, new R script, and that will open up the editing window up here. And then you can just put your cursor on that and do Control V or Paste, and that should um, put the entire script in there. Now, if you don't care about saving the script, uh, you don't need to worry about uh, the fact that it's a un untitled file. Uh, but if you do take notes or something and you want to save it, you can just click on this save button and it'll save it somewhere. Um, the other alternative, which I'll just mention, uh, if you, uh, an alternate way to do this is to go to the um, script page and then right click on the raw button and select save link as. If you do that, then you'll be prompted to save the link somewhere on your computer where you can find it. Um, and then uh, you can just open it up from within our studio. OK. It's probably easier just to do the copy and paste thing. All right, well, let's jump on in and talk about today's lesson. Um, by the way, if you have any questions anywhere along the line, please don't be shy about um, uh, unmuting your microphone and, and just come out and ask your question. If you would prefer to type your question in the chat, I've got the chat window open here, and I'll see your uh, question and try to answer it. So. Um, just for sort of full disclosure, um, a lot of what I say is going to be kind of an oversimplification. Um, so usually most of the things that we talk about will have more details, but I figure it's better to go lighter on the details now and you can pick up more things later. So I'm going to sort of oversimplify to say that there's three main common types of data in R. There's what it is called character data. Uh, in other programming languages, this might be called strings. And character data you enclose inside quotation marks. I believe that in R, you're allowed to use either single or double quotes. But the convention in R typically is to use double quotes. So that's what I'll try to do. If you actually have a number that you want to use, then you simply write the number without putting it in quotation marks. And then R knows that, the, um, that that type of data is numeric. The other kind of data um, is what's known as logical. So this is uh, basically a state of whether a condition is true or false. And um, the way that you 
uh, represent this in R is uh, writing the word true in capital letters and not putting it inside quotation marks. If you put it inside quotation marks, then R will just think it's a character uh, string and not actually a logical uh, true or false value. So you can have objects that are uh, literal objects, like the ones I showed you in the last screen, where you're literally uh, writing the value on the screen. You can also um, create what's called an, a named object. In other programming languages, this might be called a variable. So this is essentially a place where you can store data. And um, so we, there are some conventions about uh, the names that we use for objects where we store things. It's usually good to um, have the name represent either what kind of data the object contains, in other words, what the object is, or in the case of uh, functions, you'd want the name to describe what that function does. So it's, it's nice when you're trying to develop very readable code uh, to be able to just read through and see what things are by having descriptive names. And even if you're the only person using the code, a lot of times I forget even a week later what I'm doing in my code. So it's very helpful to have uh, to use descriptive names. So one of, I, I think the most common convention for R is to use what's called snake case. Snake case is if you want to describe an object with more than one word, you write the words in lower case, and then you put an underscore in between each of the words so that you have essentially a single name that's connected with underscores. Another thing that people sometimes use is what's known as camel case. Um, and in camel case, you, you don't leave any space between the words. You put them right next to each other. and the first letter is lowercase, and then the beginning letter of each subsequent word you write in uppercase. Um, and I used to be in the habit of doing this a lot, so there may be some code examples where you see me using camel case like this. It's totally legal in R, but um, the style, the preferred style, is to use snake case. Um, just to be clear, R really doesn't have any idea what a name means. So even if you look at a name and it's called ordinary relational processes, that gives you some understanding, but R doesn't have any idea what it is. It's just simply a named storage uh, space. Uh, so you can't, ex if you name a variable pi or something like that, then R doesn't know that that variable contains pi. Um, it only contains pi if you put the number pi in it. So uh, an important operator is uh, the assignment operator. And in some programming languages, we, we use equal signs for this. And in fact, equal sign is allowed in R, but it's not conventional. The conventional way that you assign things to an object is using uh, this combination of a less than and dash symbol, which forms essentially a little left word pointing arrow. Depending on your keyboard, um, if you have sort of a normal PC keyboard, I believe you can do alt dash and it'll automatically do both of these characters. Uh, if you have a Mac keyboard, there isn't any alt key and it doesn't work. But if you have a PC, you can do that. So if I want to create uh, a named object that contains the characters S-T-E-V-E, -E, I can do it like this. Take the literal string Steve, use this leftward pointing arrow, and then put it into a variable called, or a named object called name. Um, here, I am creating a numeric object by taking a number and assigning it to a variable. So um, R is like some other programming languages where the type of thing that a 
a named object contains isn't determined until you put something into it. Um, in some programming languages, you are required before you use a variable to, uh, to say what kind of thing it's intended to hold. R does not require that. It just basically learns what it's supposed to hold by the type of the thing that you put into it. Um, let's see, I had a thought and it has evaporated. Okay, maybe I'll think of it later. The other thing that is a little bit about uh, different about R and other programming languages is there's not really a built-in print command. So if you want to see what the value is of a particular object or some kind of expression, you just uh, write the name of the object and uh, when you execute that line, you will uh, then see what the contents are of that object in the console window. Okay, so let's uh, leave the slides for a little bit and, uh, oh, no, I guess not, sorry. Not ready for that yet. <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about functions. A function is a, um, a block of code that you can execute uh, as a chunk. And it's basically like a named block of code. And so you can think of a function as kind of like a, a machine where you put something into it. The thing you put into it is called an argument. And then the thing that some kind of processing happens to what you put into it and then there's some value that get re gets returned out of the function um, after it's processed by the function. So uh, the way that you write a function is you have a function name then you have parentheses and then the arguments that are going to be passed into the function are given as a, a list of items separated by commas. Um, so usually we try, as I said before, we try to um, name functions according to what they do. So if, if my imaginary function makes lattes, then I could call it something like make latte. And then the things that I would put into that function to make a latte would be beans, milk, and water. And then what the uh, return value that comes out of the function then gets in this case, I'm assigning it to an object called my latte. If I just wanted to evaluate the function without assigning it to any variable, then I wouldn't have to put my latte in the arrow. I could just simply write make latte and the arguments. And then when I executed that line, I would just see what it was. So there are several ways that you can use functions. There are some functions that are just built into R. You don't have to do anything in order to use them. And we'll see some examples of those. Um, you can also define functions in your own code. We're not really going to get into that because most of the stuff that we need to do, um, there are already functions defined for that. Um, but if you are interested, especially if you end up writing code that needs to be reused over and over again, then it's worthwhile to put it in the form of a function. But the other very common way that we, um, that we get functions is by uh, using functions that have been defined by someone else in a package. And so um, we'll see how you load packages a little bit later on. Once you've loaded a package, then you're able to use any of the functions that are in that, the code that's included in that package. And there's a, a a specific package manager that we can use to do the, the uh, loading. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, there are a lot of built-in functions. There are a lot of functions that we get from somebody else. We don't really have to know all the details of how the code works. What we need to know is what do we have to put into it? What does it do and what are we going to get out of it? And so uh, in most cases, we can 
if it's not obvious, we can go to some kind of like a help file or some sort of documentation in order to understand um, what the, uh, the arguments are and the possible values and things like that. So a lot of times for each of the modules that you might want to load into R, usually we'll have uh, a website or a, a page that you can go to to see exactly how to use that function. Um, there are also some really good uh, books that have instructions. And I just wanted to point out um, that at the bottom of the, or near the bottom of the landing page, there's a link to o the O'Reilly for Higher Education books. These are actually my favorite books for um, learning coding. And uh, there are several books that uh, are really good um, for learning R and they're available free to anybody who has a Vanderbilt login as an ebook. Um, there is also another very common book um, on data science by Hadley Wickham, and it's just available directly online. So if you are trying to understand how to use a function or do anything else in R, um, that's an option for you. So as I said, you don't have to assign the output of a function. If you just simply put the function on a line, um, you can see what it does or you can take the output of the function and you can assign it to a variable if you want to use it somewhere else. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions before I move on from here? All right, I'm not hearing a lot of questions. So as I said, feel free um, to type something in the chat. I'm, I'm watching that uh, if you want to ask a question. So um, one of the things, if you watch the introductory video that I talked about is that there is kind of a, a difference between R and some other coding languages like Python. And because of uh, R's history as a stats um, processing language, it has a lot of really powerful built-in tools for working with large structures of data. So in the R lesson, so like in the Python lessons, we start off with a bunch of very granular things, how you work with individual data items. But in R, you pretty much jump in right away and start working with uh, larger data structures. Uh, and the most important and common data structure in R is what's known as a vector. So if you have a, a background in math or physics, you may already have some sort of idea what a vector is and, and this sort of mathematical idea of what a vector is, is what informs the design of this data structure. But Essentially, a vector we can think of as a set of storage spaces, and we can put things in those storage spaces. So in the example here, I created a vector called animal, and it has uh, four slots that I can put character strings in. So I've put the names of four animals in here. And in R, the uh, numbering of things begins with one. This is different if you're used to Python. In Python, we always start numbering things with at zero, but in R, we start numbering them with one. So if I want to refer to each of these storage slots, I just put one or whatever the number is of the slot inside square brackets after the name of the vector and that will, will uh, indicate that I'm talking about that particular type of slot. One of the restrictions about vectors is that they have to ha always have the same kind of data. So I cannot mix uh, 
character strings and numbers in a vector. I cannot mix Boolean true or falses and character strings. I have to have only one kind of thing. You'll notice that the title of this slide is, sorry, just a minute. Sorry, nothing like a junk phone call in the middle of working at home. Um, okay, uh, let's see, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I, I entitled this Vectors Are King in R because really vectors are, are e even things that seem simpler than vectors actually are also vectors. And so that's why we have to jump right away into learning about them. So if we want to make a vector, uh, a short vector, the simplest way to do it is to use a function called the construct function. And because we use the construct function so often, it's abbreviated just as C. So here you see the format of a function that I talked about just a minute ago. Here's the name of the function, some parentheses, and then the series of things that I want to pass into the function separated by commas. So this C and then these numbers here will construct a vector and then I can take the vector that I've constructed and assign it to a, a, a named object called number vector. And here is the vector that I was showing in the example on the last slide. I'm constructing it as a vector and putting it into a variable called animal. Now if you want to have like say a vector that contains all the numbers from one to a thousand, you're not going to want to have to write them all out. So there's actually a shorthand way of creating a sequence of numbers by simply indicating the range of the numbers that you want uh, with the starting and ending number separated by colons. And so if I want the numbers from three to nine, I can write it like this. If I want the number sequence to go down instead of up, I can start with the biggest number first and the smallest number second. You can also have negative numbers. So this would be the sequence of numbers ranging from positive five all the way down to negative three. And so this sequence that I've created here is actually just a vector. So writing three colon nine is exactly the same thing as if I had put C parentheses, three comma, four comma, five, et cetera, up through nine. Uh, one final note, if you're coming over to using R from Python, I mentioned that the default on R is to start with one instead of zero. There's also that weird thing in Python where the last number in uh, a range is ignored, that does not happen in Python. If you put three colon nine, you get all the numbers from three to nine, just as you would normally expect. Okay, here is a question. Uh, in three colon nine, are both three and nine included? Yes, that is, um, that is correct. The, th the numbers on either end are included. Okay, so if we make a vector, it turns out there are several ways that we can um, find out what is in the vector. We can um, type the name of the vector and execute that line and then it'll show up in the console. We can also um, use the environment data pane, and I'll demonstrate this in just a moment. If we're using RStudio, we can use that, do that. And we can also ask questions about it. For example, if we wanna know how many items are in the vector, we can use the link, fu link function. And if we know what, wanna know what kind of data is in the vector, we can use the mode function. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and take a look uh, here. Okay, another, let's see. Can you change the step in a range? 
I believe that is true. Um, so, I, and I'm not, I think perhaps you put another colon with the step. We can try that. Um, I don't, I don't do that very often, so I'm a little rusty on that. Um, but when we get down to the range example, let's try that. Okay, so here's the script. And as you may recall, in our studio, if you want to um, execute a line, all you need to do is put the cursor on that line and click run and it will, um, and it will execute just that one particular line. So if I click run, um, now nothing was shown uh, here because this is my script. This is essentially a list of the instructions. When I run a line in my script that I'm composing here, it shows up in the console down below. So here it basically got echoed down here, but it doesn't show me what is in the vector because I didn't ask it to show me. Um, if I wanted to do that, I could just go down to the console here at the bottom and type number, and it's giving me autocomplete. And if I hit enter here, it shows me what numbers are in the vector. So anything you want to have happen immediately, you can type it down here. If you type things up in the editing window, they only execute when you uh, select the line and click run. Now, the other thing that I mentioned is that you can look in the, in the global environment pane over here, and you can see it gives me both the name of the vector, um, and then it shows me over here the values of the vectors as well. So. Now, one thing is if your um, script has comments in it, like I have here, so a, a comment is a line that has a pound sign in front of it or a hash sign, um, and those get ignored. So if I'm on a line that is a comment and I click run, it will go to the next runnable line and do that. So I don't, I don't have to click twice, I can just click once. Okay, so now I see that animal has shown up over here in my environment. And again, if I want to know what's in animal, I can also just type it down here. And I can see what it is. Uh, and then here are the sequence examples. So let's go ahead and run those. The um, number range from three to nine, you can see over here. and count down the numbers start at 10 and go down and then here's the negative example all right um okay why does the function mode display the type instead of the frequency oh okay so yeah that's uh so the mode is not the statistical function mode it is the mode. So there's actually two different um, terms in Python for, that sort of describe the kind of thing something is. And the, the mode is essentially whether it's character, whether it's string, and so on. So I can't remember what the, the there is a statistical function for mode, and we could um, look up and see what that is. But, um, but this particular function is not the statistical mode. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the question was asked, oops, I made an error. How do I delete a vector? Um, if you, um, if the vector is one that you want, all you have to do is just reassign a new value to it and it will overwrite the original value. If you don't want the vector anymore, then, um, you can just ignore it and it'll sit there in your environment and not, and it won't do anything. Um, let me go ahead and, uh, and finish these uh, examples here. But uh, the other thing you, well, okay, I'll just show you this now, actually. If you go to your environment window and you click on this little broom, then what it'll do is basically delete everything that's in your environment. So now if I run this and ask what is the length of animal, 
it doesn't know because I just deleted that vector. The other thing that I didn't mention yet, I think it might have been in the earlier video, is that if you want to run a whole series of, of lines and you don't want to have to click run, 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 you can just select them. And then if you hit run, it'll execute all of the lines that you highlighted. This is an RStudio thing. So I did that and now I have all of my numbers back again. So let's go ahead and, and do length of animal. Okay, so it showed me the length is four because there were four animals in the list. And the mode of animal is character. It's telling me that that is a vector that contains characters. Now, I'm just going to try, I kind of think this is what happens. Nope, doesn't, that's not how you do it. Okay, I'm going to have to look that up. Um, but I, there is a way that you can step through a range. I just don't remember what it is. Uh, okay. So it, as I said before, if we want to reference particular parts of the vector, so for instance, the third animal in the list, um, I can just do that. It shows me that the third animal in my list is worm. If I want to change one of the values in the list, I can uh, just simply assign whatever I want using the assignment arrow and it'll replace what was in there uh, before with the new thing. So now if I type, uh, oops, if I go down here and I type animal, now it says frog arachnid worm and bee instead of frog spider worm and bee because I replaced the second item. Now let's see what happens if we do this one. So if we put a range, just like we, uh, uh, we're creating up here inside of the square brackets, then it will, it will, the output of that will be, or, or I should say the value of that will be the item numbers that are in that range. So if I say two colon four, that will give me the second, the third, and the fourth item in that vector. And so this is actually itself another vector. Um, a vector that uh, contains the last three items in the list. Um, okay, so this is what we just saw, um, how we do assignment, and that you can uh, reference. This is called creating a sub vector because basically it's a part of your uh, uh, original vector. Okay, question. You can generate a, ah, okay. You can generate a sequence vector with a step by using the sequence function. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, hmm. oh, okay. I'm just trying to copy and paste this out of the chat. All right, let's try that. Okay, so thank you for that. So this is a way that you, um, that you can generate uh, something more complicated than just using a range. Thanks, Charisse. Okay, now the other thing that, um, that seems a little bit weird um, is that um, there actually isn't any such thing as a, uh, as a object that just contains a single thing. So we can take something like this and, and take a single character string and assign it to a named object. And it would seem like we've just created an object with a single thing in it. But actually what we've done is we've created a vector that just has only one thing in it. So this is why I said basically vectors are king because sometimes even when we don't know that we're making a vector, we actually are. And we can see this because if we ask what the length of an item is, it will say one, just as if we had um, uh, 
created it using the construct um, the construct function. Also, we can reference the item, the single item, by using the uh, square bracket notation and just say that we want item number one. So let's try that. So I've assigned a string and then I ask the length of it. The length is one. And then I say print using the vector notation, print the value of the first item in the vector and it gives me the string. So uh, essentially, an unindexed uh, thing like this is the same thing as a vector that uh, has a length of one. Okay, so let me pause here for just a moment. And again, let's see if there's any more questions. Okay, great, let's move on then. So um, one of the cool things about um, R is that it's very uh, easy to just perform an operation on an entire vector. In something like a standard Python, if you wanted to take the square root of a whole list of items, you'd have to loop through the list and take the square root of each item one at a time. But R actually makes it super easy to just perform an operation on every item in the vector by simply pass, <coughs> excuse me, by simply passing the vector into the function that does the operation. So um, here's an example. So if I, so back here, let's see, where's my number vector? Here's my number vector. And if I want to take the square root of every item in that vector, I can just pass it into the square root function. And you see, I get the square root of all five of the numbers that were in the vector. So in fact, the output of that function is another vector. And the, each of the items in the vector is the same, uh, is the square root of the item that's in the same rel uh, relative position in the string that I put. Uh, that I put in, uh, sorry, in the vector that I put into it. So the second item is three, and then in the output, the second item is the square root of three. Okay. The other thing is that if you want to perform even mathematical operations, you can do them on an entire vector uh, at a time. So in this example here, I'm constructing a, a, a vector with three items in it, 10, 30, and 100, and then a second vector with 5, 10, and 20. And if I divide the first vector by the second vector, then it will take each of the numbers uh, in the same rel uh, relative position and divide them by each other. So 10 divided by 5 is 2, 30 divided by 10 is 3, 100 divided by 20 is 5. So again, it's very easy to perform a whole lot of calculations and a whole bunch of things all at once uh, by using vectors. So I'm going to mention um, two other more complicated data structures, and we won't go into a lot of detail on these now but I just want to make you aware that they exist. So, um, and, and this is something that you will encounter primarily if you're doing um, like a lot of statistics or math operations. So if you're doing like visualization and stuff, it doesn't, it's not used as much, but um, you can take a vector and essentially assign it to two dimensions. So you could take a vector that has 20 items in it and say, I want th that that vector actually represents a matrix that has two rows and 10 items in each row. Or you could say it has 10 rows with two, I uh, with two items in each row. 
So um, that's useful for, for certain kinds of mathematical um, operations. And an array is just simply a multi-dimensional version of a matrix. So you don't have to only have two dimensions. You can actually have as many dimensions as you want. All right, see you. Um, I'll have the recording up if you want to catch the end of it. OK, um, so because matrices and arrays are just a kind of like a variation on vectors, the rule that a vector has to um, only contain one kind of thing also applies to matrices and arrays as well. And so uh, if I, in the example down here, uh, I have a vector that has a bunch of numbers. This is how I would say I want it to uh, be a two by three matrix. Okay, the other thing that I want to mention, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but this will come up uh, fairly often, is the idea of uh, how you represent missing data. And there's actually several different kinds of missing data indicators, and I'm just going to talk about two right now. The one that's the most common is NA. Um, if you put NA into some kind of data structure, it means that there should be a value there, but we don't know what it is. It's missing. So uh, an NA so NA is actually a value. It's just a value that we don't know. There is another kind of missing data um, called null, and that's a little bit different because it basically means there isn't any value. So if you want to think of the difference, uh, NA has a length of one, null has a length of zero because it's basically not there. Um, NA is actually a very useful thing because if you have, uh, let's say you uh, created this vector with missing, like I showed here. And then you ask R to take the average of those num numbers. It would throw an error because um, one of the numbers is missing. And it'll say, well, I can't calculate that because you have missing numbers. So um, there, there is a way that you can tell R to ignore missing numbers. Uh, and then it'll go ahead and do the calculation. But the point is that you have to do that um, knowingly. So it, it's a way for you to sort of make sure you don't accidentally try to calculate something that you shouldn't be calculating because some of this, uh, the items that you need in the calculations aren't there. Um, you can also, uh, so when you're creating data tables, which we'll talk about um, later, you can use uh, NAs in there. Uh, and that's different than like in Excel or some other, or CSV or something where you might just leave it be uh, blank or you might use negative 999 or there's several kinds of conventions for, mi for missing values. Okay, so um, I'm going to wrap up here with a, a couple uh, more complicated data structures. So we talked about um, vectors. And the thing that I said about vectors is that um, they have to only contain one kind of thing. A list is sort of like a vector, except that you're not restricted to have only one kind of thing in here. So here's a list that has four storage slots. This row called value is the thing that I'm actually storing in the list. And the thing that's different about the way that I'm using this list is that I can give names to each one of the storage slots. It turns out you can give names to each slot in a vector too, but it's not done very commonly, so we won't really talk about that. But it's quite common to name the items in a list. And so when I've created a list and I want to refer to one of the particular items in the list, there's actually two ways that I can do it. I can refer it to it by its position in the list. And to do that, I put the position inside double square brackets, which seems a little bit weird, instead of single square brackets like we did for the vectors. Um, the problem is, of course, you have to know what position the item is in. There is 
Um, another way you can refer to the item though by, by its name, and this is very commonly done, you take the name of the list and then you put a dollar sign and then you use the name of that particular slot. So if I say uh, thing dollar sign curse, that's going to be the string that is in the um, slot that I've named curse. So just like vectors, these are one dimensional. Uh, and it's fairly common to give uh, names to them. So here's an example of the way that we create a list. So it's sort of like the construct function, except instead of being named C, it's named list parentheses. And so you simply put each of the items in the list separated by commas, but instead of just putting the value in, you put in essentially what's like a key value pair here, you put the name of the thing, an equal sign, and then the value. Then the name of the next thing, an equal sign, and the value, and so on. And so as you can see, there's three, there's, uh, three different kinds of things here. A number, two character strings, and then you can also have one of the list items be another data, a complex data type. So you can actually put a list as an item in a vector. And that turns out to be very important in um, the data structure that we're going to look at called a data frame. So if you want to find out what is in a list, um, you can look over in the global environment. But because lists are, are more complicated, it's hard to fit all the information that's in the list in that, that, um, as a line in the environment table. So if you click on the name of it, it'll pop open as a new tab in the upper left pane, and then it will show you all the details of it. Okay, let's see. I already talked about this, referencing list items, and then clearing the contents of a pane. Uh, you can use a little broom. So let's jump back here and take a look at some things. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out this. And I'm also, it doesn't really matter if I clear this out, but I'm going to go ahead and clear out the console just to make it a little less confusing. All right, so I'm going to create a list. Uh, oops, I sh forgot that one of the items was animal. So I'll have to go up here and recreate animal. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Here I am. Okay. So I've created a list, and now you see that it shows up in here thing list of four. If I click on the name, then it shows me all the details of the list what each of the named things is, what kind of a thing it is, and then also. A description of it. So here I can see this is a vector of characters that has four items in it and it's showing me the first several of them. Okay and then here is what we saw before about you can reference items in a list by either their position or their name. So we're almost, oh we are out of time actually. Okay so this is a lot of stuff for the first day. So we'll go ahead and pick up next time with uh, data frames, which is essentially a combination of lists and vectors to make a two-dimensional structure. Um, I have not done this class as many times as I have done the Python class. And one of the things that I would like to do is to develop some assignments for people to work on, like homework. Um, obviously, you're not going to have to turn it in or anything, but for people who want to have more practice. I have not done that for most of the lessons, but I do have, um, let's see, uh, okay, hmm. actually, this homework is practicing with data frames, and we haven't gotten there yet. So anyway, in the future, I'll try to see if I can come up with some uh, sort of practice things that you can work on. But uh, for now, 
I guess we'll just call it quits and we'll pick up next time with uh, data frames. So thanks everybody for um, participating and uh, please feel free if you want, if you have any questions or any follow-up uh, things you want to ask about, just uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to talk to you, uh, well, virtually talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. So see you next week and I have to figure out how to turn the recording off.